Hello everyone, my name is Nathaniel William, or Nat, and I am the head of community at Exceptional Individuals. So today we are going to be looking at dyslexia, though genuinely we support the whole spectrum of diverse ways of thinking. That includes dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, the whole package. But as I said, today we're going on dyslexia. Now, as a team, a lot of you already know who we are, but this is some of our lovely bunch. We're a social enterprise that supports people of all walks of life, from CEOs of organizations to people looking to find inclusive employment. But what makes us particularly unique is we're neurodiverse. So we're experts by experience, as well as experts by traditional means. So you can see, oh, lovely bunch. And in the chat today, we've got April, nice. We've got Kinga here as well. We've got me. And we also have Garfield who's supporting us, but we need to get a picture of him. Now, we do these webinars every single week and we record them to make sure more people can watch them. And the one we did last week was ADHD in the workplace. Now, a lot of you will know that being neurodiverse often comes with other additional things. So if any of you do have ADHD, I wouldn't be surprised as well. I'm guessing most of you have dyslexia, but maybe some of you are here today just to learn about how it affects your peers, your loved ones, colleagues, anything along those lines. But we also did have a dyslexia in the workplace a previous week, which might also be worth a check out. OK, dyslexia at 40. Now, again, why did we pick 40? Not because you magically turn into a unicorn at 40. But just because people, there's a massive increase of people who are finding out they are dyslexic later in life. And, you know, arguably a kind of young person might be 16 to 18, might be under 25, 30. But I think 40 is a safe bet when we are pretty much considered adults, at least physically, if not mentally. And. Some of you will have been diagnosed at a younger age and have a different experience, but a lot of people are getting diagnosed later on in life, um, like 30s onwards. And that does kind of like, it's interesting because when you're younger and you are told you have something, that kind of becomes part of your identity. It grows with you. You learn coping strategies with that bit of knowledge in mind. But when you're older and you get diagnosed, you've already kind of developed, you've already kind of created those coping mechanisms. And maybe you got diagnosed because those mechanisms aren't working for you. So your brain has to rewire. Now, our brain is nice and plasticky. And every time we're learning new things, it creates new neuro pathways. And the more we use those pathways, they kind of get stronger and like thicker. But the older we get, the brain's less bothered about making them. They're not as sturdy. So it gets kind of harder to reinforce those new pathways. Basically means it's harder to adapt. You can't teach an old dog new tri tricks. Not true. You can. It just takes a little bit more work because the brain is pretty chilled where it currently is with its understanding of things. So now we understand why we might want to look at dyslexia in later life, we can get to it. So first little check-in, how are we doing today? Great, meh, or down? And now this is just for me to read the room. It doesn't have any impact. Nice, we've got a lot of people who are feeling just okay. That's good enough for me. I would probably give myself a middle one as well. I didn't sleep so well, but I always like webinar day. It's a fun day. So yeah. Great stuff for most of us. Oh, and just so you know, all the little gifts I'm using today are all from successful people in their 40s plus who have dyslexia. So I didn't just pick this person for their great jiggling. It's also because they are a successful dyslexic. And this individual is an actress. So do keep an eye out on them. And I try to reference things at the top of the screen as we go along. Now, if we are successful today, there's a few things we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at what is dyslexia in later life. Is it a different diagnosis? Is it the same? Does it treat you different? And you might think, Derna, pretty obvious. But when you look at the history of dyslexia, it was very much seen as a childhood condition, a lot like the other neurodivergence. It was also very much considered a male condition, a white condition, you know, so it does change. 
And though we are smarter now than we were yesterday, that doesn't mean that society has moved in a linear path. We're still a bit outdated in a lot of regards. Why is it difficult to diagnose dyslexia in later life? Believe it or not, it's more difficult. I think the average is around seven is when most people get diagnosed, but it can be young as three. But as you get older, it's that the signs of dyslexia are hidden because you have learned to cope with the way your brain works, try to like mask, normalize activities. So if people look at you and think, mm, I'm not sure you're dyslexic, they probably work with young people on a more day-to-day -day basis. So if any of you are thinking, you know what, maybe I will get a diagnosis, always speak to the person doing the assessment and says, do you have much experience with adults? Because if their experience is solely with um, uh, adolescents, don't be surprised if they miss some of the uh, signs and signals just because they're going to be a bit more suppressed or dampened. What happens after you get diagnosed? Are you slapped with a goodie bag and told to be on your day? Does anything happen? And what made you want to get diagnosed as an adult? So, again, why is it important to know what made you want to have one? When you're younger, you're kind of obliged. You know, if you do not get that kind of a certificate, that tick on a paper, you're not going to get extra time. You're not going to get equipment, you're not going to get support. As an adult, that is less true. You know, whether you're diagnosed or not, doesn't really matter. Maybe you're doing it for your own personal self, for your own kind of justification to kind of shed some light on why you are the way you are. Maybe you do work in a bad employer and they kind of like, you need it. So there's different reasons and we're going to be looking at those. Now for a quick definition, dyslexia. Officially, it is a learning disorder that affects both children and adults. Now, I know the word disorder is a little bit scary. Try not to get spooked. We use the word disorder in a clinical setting because it is something which causes like distress or challenges in day to day life. It doesn't mean that it is inherently a disorder, but in the world we live in, I think most people could argue it does have its swings and roundabouts. Its symptoms are different with age and also severity as well. So people think it's just like, a, you know, you are born with dyslexia, you die with dyslexia, typically it is lifelong, but that doesn't mean it's like an easy path. It's like roller coasters. It might be really dominant in childhood and then like simmer down. It might be pretty manageable and then you go for a stressful period in your life. But it doesn't have to go that way. Sometimes it could be not that impactful in your childhood but as you become like a more adult your situation change you might find actually it's impacting you more than it ever has previously so it doesn't necessarily get easier with age uh symptoms are very different generally people with dyslexia have difficulty breaking down words into simple sounds now we all know that's an oversimplification it's a lot oh indigo says specific learning difficulty is what i was told yeah, and the terms do change a lot as well. So don't be surprised if you have been told different things. Tomato, tomato in a lot of sense. Depends what the flavor of the month is, depending who your diagnostic assessor is. There's a lot of different factors that kind of get involved. Oh, Sanchan says, definitely my dyslexia has become worse with my age. No, thanks for sharing that. And I think that is not something which is reported not nearly enough. So a quick one here. What symptoms do any of you have? And hopefully this can apply whether or not you know you're dyslexic or not. Do you have difficulties with reading? Do you have troubles with mathematics? Do you struggle with memorizing things? What about time management? Overreacting to mistakes? Now, this is one we don't talk about a lot, but typically if you make a mistake for people with dyslexia, they have like a whole internal crisis because they're reevaluating their entire self-worth. You also have low self-esteem from being told you're not good enough, uh, you're from yourself and from others. Now, if you notice, some of these are things that are baked into the diagnosis of dyslexia and others are related to the way that society impacts you. But you can't really separate them because we live in this world. So they do go hand in hand. Oh, let's tell you what we've got. We've got most people overreacting to mistakes. That's an interesting one. I put that one on there new today and it's interesting. It got a quite a high one. And also, interestingly, reading, which is what people think of the ABCs of dyslexia, didn't get the highest one. 
And that is very telling. Oh, nice. Sanjan says all of them. It affects all of them. But again, not all at once and not at the same level. It can vary. It can move. Things can change. So what decade were you born in? Don't worry, this is anonymous. Were you pre-50s? If so, great for coming here. Were you swinging 60s? What other decades are there? 70s, 80s, 90s or beyond? Okay, great stuff. So we've got someone from the 60s, we've got 90s, great. And again, this is important. Why? Because people's views of themselves and others with dyslexia vary dramatically depending on the decade you were born in. Just 100 years ago, uh, you were told to be word blind. You know, they thought it affected your vision. People then thought it was intelligence based, which it's not. You know, in um, like the 70s and 80s, people thought you were a cold pair and you like weren't very treated very well. And like 90s, uh, or like all different theories. So your view, understanding and perception of the learning condition does have an impact depending on your decade, worth taking into fact. And we're not just talking about your own identification, we're also talking about others around you. And if you notice, the uh, in terms of decades, the, the further we go along in time, the more people getting diagnosed. Why? Well, I'm guessing you can work that out more people are feeling comfortable to talk about it and more people are getting diagnosed. There's no like sudden other reason for an increase. So dyslexia in adults, what are some of the key differences? Well, for one, a lot of people who have dyslexia in an adult are not aware. It's not that they're just not diagnosed, they really don't know because this is just how their brain works. They've only known this way of thinking. So it can be more challenging because you don't know how to research support strategies. It also affects one in 10, really common. And this does change because in child, in adolescence, most people would find like there's a higher percentage of children with dyslexia. But considering we know it's a lifelong condition, it seems odd that why would there be more children that have it? And then it just kind of drops off as you get an adult. Well, it doesn't drop off. These people just kind of blend into the world and maybe what was a severe problem because of the education system in day-to-day -day adult life maybe it's not so much of an issue that's not the case for everyone but it would explain why we see a big drop in the amount of people reporting that they have dyslexia and lastly learning differently so again with children it's quite often that when you have dyslexia, they try to support you to learn the way that everyone else learns. But as an adult, you typically think, I'm just going to learn the way that my brain works because CBA to learn a style which just isn't working for me. I mean, let me know if you kind of agree or disagree with these things. Anything else that has changed as a dyslexic adult? So for all of you, I'd love to know your thoughts. Is there things which you have noticed, like either it might be you think things are easier now, or maybe things are more difficult, maybe they stayed the same, maybe people's views are a change. Do you see dyslexia different how you saw it as an adolescent? Let me know. Oh, Indigoa says, for me, it was work colleagues who said they thought I was dyslexic. My response was, but I can read. Yeah, that is a classic one. Quite often, people just assume it's to being illiterate. I don't know if this is a correct stat, but I read somewhere that like 1% of dyslexics have are illiterate, meaning they can't read. The vast, vast, vast majority of dyslexics absolutely can. We've got, I'm now more confident. Great for you. Uh, I would say the same. It doesn't mean that the challenges go away, but you're kind of more self-assured with yourself. Yes, I thought I was stupid when I was at school. You and me both. The school system isn't created for dyslexics. We are very much an afterthought, if not a for at all. I think, you know, maybe it's getting better, but the way we, I think sets are kind of divvied up in terms of like intelligence or ability aren't really fair. I was stuck in the class with all the people who were picking their nose and licking windows. That's not what I wanted to be a part. I wanted to be challenged and pushed. I just wanted it tailored for my way of processing. But because that wasn't done and because it wasn't acknowledged, I thought I was one of the, um, the people who struggled.
Uh, it's a tough one, isn't it? I'm a lot more open about it and I'm proud. I use colors a lot. That's brilliant. I think, you know, I'm a proud of it as well now. It's, uh, you know, yes, it's a bit of a double-edged sword sometimes, but there is a lot of positives that go with it. I'm more open about being dyslexic and explaining it to others and how it affects me. Yes, we get learner at, better at learning to explain it to others. Again, when you're younger, you might just say, eh, I can't read very well. But as you get older, you can kind of add so much more color and depth, which can turn something which is a perceived negative into probably a un unique selling point. We've got, I only found out this year, everyone was surprised. <laughs> I feel much better knowing everything makes more sense. Yes, and that is definitely something we're going to be touching on a bit more later about how understanding yourself, even if you get no kind of extra goodies or benefits through being diagnosed, that self-awareness can make a big difference. We also got saying, becoming more aware of other neurodivergent traits in me. Yes, sometimes dyslexia can be like the Pandora's box on opening up a whole smorgasbord of different ways of thinking and processing. Many people say dyslexia is the marijuana of the neurodivergent world. Gets you hooked. Jokes. No one says that. But it kind of makes sense, you know. It is a very accessible way of understanding how other parts of the brain may function because it is less kind of tabooed and stigma compared to ones like autism or ADHD. So some fun facts on managing adult dyslexia. Now, originally this title was treating and I, I don't really like the word treating. It's not, you can't get rid of it, um, but kind of learning to work with it can be really beneficial. So first of all, training and tutoring. Now, for me, there's two ways of doing this. One, you're, tra you're trying to train yourself to work like everyone else. And that actually might work for some people. But for me, I think that leads to burnout eventually because your brain is kind of working uphill. I'd rather find strategies that work for my type of brain. Then we've got your occupational therapist. They kind of support you with finding like the ways that work for you. A little bit more holistic. You've got reasonable adjustments, you know, things like access to work, workplace needs assessments. They're essentially covered under the UK Equality Act, which means an employer has to do them. Um, if they don't, you know, get in contact. Request instructions to be spoken instead of written. Now, this is a really simple one, but a lot of the time with people with dyslexia or any neurodivergence, the key challenge is about communication. So if you are misinterpreting things, then try to get it given in multiple formats and do a little bit of cross-referencing. So if someone has written something down, I then ask them to verbally tell me, or someone has verbally told me, I ask them to write it down. And then I kind of compare the two and make sure I've understood it. If there's some like discrepancies, then I would seek for further explanation. Maybe I'm being over the top, but I'd rather have the extra time in the beginning rather than having a lot of extra time towards the end. Okay, so we have... Find methods to help you learn and remember. Seems basic, but there's so many strategies. I'm terrible at spelling, so I remember a lot of things like said, Superman and I dance, because big elephants can't always understand small elephants. Uh, you know, lots of things like that, that really help. And finally, additional training in tasks that make you more, that make you uncomfortable. I think a lot of the time people who are dyslexic will typically say, I hate reading and you don't hate reading. You hate the way it made you feel when you were forced to read and no one was teaching you strategies. I think if you continue to learn to like to read in your own way, you might find actually you quite like it. I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Some may say that's not reading. I say whatever it is reading and I love reading now and I get free loads of audiobooks a year. So now let's do a quick brief history of dyslexia. Why? Because it might help you understand why you think the way you do about your own dyslexia and probably more likely why others think the way they think about your dyslexia. Nice. Indigoa says, I like larger print or yellow backgrounds on paper. Definitely that helps a lot of people. For me, it's more of a light bluish color that seems to work well. Sanjan says, I try to do brain train games regular to improve my grammar and vocabulary. Yes, great. When I used to have like a Nintendo DS, I'd always play those brain training games. I'm not sure if it actually trained my brain, but. 
April says, when my sister was younger, she would learn how to spell because with the sentences, big elephants can always understand small elephants. Yeah, I mean, there's different ones, you know, like never under it. Oh, there's lots of them, actually. Some of them not so appropriate, but whatever helps you remember. So anyway, let's do a brief history of dyslexia. Started off in 1877, cracking on a bit, word blindness. So if you had dyslexia, people just assumed it was a type of like visual impairment. And then it kind of changed to kind of more terminology. Then in 1887, dyslexia was first used. So actually it's been around a while, but not really as long as some people would think. Then in the 1900s, the first report of child reading disability. So don't get me wrong, like when it was first mentioned, you know, it cropped up in conversation, but it wasn't until the 19th century where we're like, oh, okay, it's now actually reported. But remember, still in children at this point. Then in the 1930s, dyslexia comes common. Most people have heard of it. Doesn't mean they understand it, but they've heard of it. So it's starting to pick up a bit of momentum, but it still has baggage attached to be like word blindness. Still needs shifting a little bit. Moving on to the 60s, learning disability is first used. So they're kind of changing the terms around, making it a bit more descriptive because let's face it, if you've never heard of the word dyslexia, it doesn't really give that much away. It's a bit of an odd word. Also a very ironic word because it's not the easiest to spell. Then in the 1990s, we start to do a bit of brain research. So we realized it's a thing. What's going on with the hood? And you know, brain research is difficult, not the easiest. So we're starting, doesn't mean we're particularly getting anywhere. But in 2002, we start to do MRIs. These are where you kind of go in those like space age machines and they kind of like see where the brain is like lightening up. And it turns out there is a difference for people who have dyslexia and those who do not have dyslexia, there is a difference. And these are really important adjustments because again, at the start, it was just something which was kind of conceived and you know is it real isn't it real i don't know but now the scientific evidence that dyslexia is real so it's not so much like not denied anymore most people accept it as a thing but it depends kind of when you were born and when the research kind of came to light 2005 we found a dyslexic gene now this still needs a lot more research but it kind of showing us that dyslexia is hereditary. It does run in the family. It is something that you are born with. Because some people are like, is it just people who are bad at reading? No, it is actually baked into your DNA, which again, changes how society looks at something when they understand like the origin. But bear in mind, early days, early days indeed. So quick question to all of you again, influences. What do you think influences your dyslexia the most? Now, this could be how it presents itself, how you see it, kind of any of those. We've talked a bit about historical context, a little bit about kind of science, but what about the others? We've got things like culture and race. You know, some cultures don't even accept that dyslexia is a thing. So that will have a big impact. The time we lived in, if you grew up in the swing in 60s, maybe dyslexia will seem very different. The media, again, anything in the media is like, I can't read, I got the dyslexia. You know, they're not exactly the most empowering. And family values and belief. Some families are proper advocates and like, you can do anything you want to be. Others are like, you're dumb, um, unfortunately. Oh, and also we've got educational policies in the systems. So how the education world has taught us. So the results are in, and the number one is the education system. Yeah, let's say it screwed a lot of us up. It's very, very outdated, and it's such a beast. It's so hard. It's a hard thing to change. Media, the media has a bigger impact on us than any of us would ever think. The time we live in, race, family values, are really interesting, actually. And these things are as much to do with how we see ourselves as the condition itself. The label is empty without these other contextual things kind of giving it meaning, whether positive or negative. Nice. Sanjana says, educational policies and families and values. Completely get you. So now, quick question again to all of you. When did you get diagnosed slash believe you had dyslexia? 
So I appreciate not everyone's going to be diagnosed and neither should you be necessarily. For me, it's a difficult one because I, th- I knew I was dyslexic like all my life really because my mum was very certain about it but it wasn't until I was 16 when I was officially diagnosed um, however I was diagnosed pre-16 and then it stopped being valid after that they've now changed the rules a little bit so it's interesting how a diagnosis which is seemingly for life can become invalid or at least could have been So, yeah, let's see what anyone else has got. We've got at 48 years old. Wow. But, yeah, I mean, I'd love to know, like, why you why you wanted to get that diagnosis. Uh, 17. I mean, did how did it help? 17. Interesting. So actually, you know, when I said dyslexia at 40 is actually we're not far off. A lot of people do kind of get around that age range. And that maybe the assessments are becoming a bit more accessible. Don't get me wrong, they're still expensive because I don't think they're covered by the NHS. Sometimes there's grants in different school systems, maybe employers will do it, but there's not kind of like a consistent, oh, this organisation will help you out. Oh, nice. So we've got, I, I got it through work because I was struggling. See, that's nice. Not a lot of workplaces will offer that. Um, so that's great if you can. So next one, what was it like before you got diagnosed? Now, this question will be different depending on when you were diagnosed, but were you kind of like ignorance is bliss or were you more confused and lost? Was there any things that there was a noticeable difference? Hey, I appreciate this is maybe a difficult question. So let's have a little think. What was it like before you got diagnosed? I guess for me, I just had a lot less support in school. I were just see perceived as a very slow developer rather than someone who had a recognized medical condition. We've also got one here that says it was difficult to understand the world. I think that's really true as well, because remember, dyslexia doesn't affect intelligence. So your brain is like very, very aware that you're struggling to understand things and kind of pull them apart. We've got confused and didn't understand why I did things differently. And it's difficult because, again, it's not like you're talking to other people and think, oh, I've got this, I've got this, and create the kind of unity. It feels very isolating because it's not something you share. Thought I was stupid. Sadly, that is one of the big ones. We also got confused and struggling in education at every stage, needed extra help from teachers. I think the biggest thing I'm getting here is it affected a lot of our self-esteem. Uh, just a quick shout out to Anne who is an Arctic traveller who was, I think, the first female-led team to go across the Arctic and dyslexic. So a really inspirational woman who um, I recommend searching more if you can. I I was very slow in learning, always behind others, but at university, I was the best. The diagnostic did nothing for me as none knew what to do. That's interesting, actually. Still improving. Again, it can affect you different in your life. Whether or not a diagnosis is beneficial or not to you, I think that's quite an individual thing, not just personally, but also determined in the society that you find yourself around. Not all universities are created equal. Held back because of being misunderstood a lot. Yeah, I'm a year older than most of my friends because I started everything a year later. It's tough. And I don't think teachers, well, I think they're starting to realise it can have quite a big impact on people. But before, send them back. No, it wasn't really a big deal. Okay, I hope you're all still doing good. Still with me. If diagnosed in later life, what made you want to do it? So I know some of you have already answered on this, but if you could put it again, that would be great. So I think one of you said your work wanted you to get to it or offered it because you were struggling at work. Did anyone else have any other reasons about why they wanted to get diagnosed? Uh, Okay, I was studying. Nice. I mean, I'm studying at the moment as well. And I tell you what, if I didn't have support for my dyslexia, like the extra time, there's no chance I would survive. But uh, the university is really strict. You have to show them valid proof. It's annoying the amount of hoops you have to jump through in order to be treated equally. I was studying a master's and was curious about some quirks and their test such support was on offer. Oh, that's great. 
So it seems a lot of you are like right place, right time. You know, if it's offered, why not? What about anyone else? Did anyone get it like privately? I think that's always interesting when people will, you know, use their own money because it is an expensive uh, investment. At high school only, because my mum knew there was nothing, there was something not right. Yes, mums are can be a great advocate. I probably wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for my mum kind of championing, trying to really support my studies and say, you know what, he needs help. You know, do not ignore this individual. Okay, now we've got a uh, creepy picture of Jennifer Aniston, kind of like a, just staring into our souls. But she is dyslexic, by the way, and another great role model. So a few reasons why people may want to get diagnosed, not exhaustive, but it's a starting point, is to overcome trauma. Remember, like, if you've been told your entire life, you're dumb, you're stupid, you're thick, you know, you know nothing, you'll never amount to anything, that's going to take a toll. But if someone can say, actually, you know what? Your struggles weren't your fault. There is a reason behind it, which you had no control over. That can be uplifting. That can like, you know, make you feel a lot freer. It can help you understand yourself, give you context. You know, if you don't understand your own mind, how can you expect anyone else to? To educate yourself, you know, knowledge is power. If we have the understanding about how our brain works, we can actually make decisions which can help us. So for instance, I would, wouldn't go for a role which wouldn't allow me to use my assistive technology because I know I'd find it too difficult. I actually really wanted to be a doctor, right? But actually, that's not the life for me because the way it's done, I would struggle more than what I would benefit from it. Get support. Yes, sometimes support is only available if you're dyslexic. I don't think that's right, but that's how it's done. And another one is sometimes you'll find that you learn that your child has dyslexia and because you know it's hereditary and you've seen a lot of their characteristics in you, you might want to explore it a little bit further to find out a bit more about what ticks. So now let's look at some famous dyslexic adults. We've looked at a few already, and uh, there are some pretty interesting ones. And why I wanted to show these is not just because they're dyslexic, but because it has actually been beneficial to their career. Whoopi Goldberg is a great example. I'm not going to give you a fact about Whoopi because I've got one coming up, but hold on to that. Then we've got Richard Branston. He was a school dropout, very entrepreneurial, and his brain would always wonder and he'd create so many things. He is a big advocate of dyslexia. And if you ever need any inspirational quotes from a powerful rich white man, I highly recommend it. No, but genuinely, he is a good advocate. So we've also got Orlando Bloom. I think a fun fact. Johnny Depp, Orlando Bloom, and Kira Knightley, who are all in Pirates of the Caribbean, are all dyslexic. That must have been fun for the director. Oh, and also Princess Beatrice, um, again, big advocate of dyslexia. So I promise you some Whoopi Goldberg action, and I'm going to deliver. So a great quote from her is that some people read really fast, but you ask them questions about their script, and they'll forget. I take a long time to read a script but I read it, but I read it only once. And this, for me, is a really great quote because it very much acknowledges the challenges of dyslexia. If you were to compare, you know, apples to oranges, the apples would probably win um, because they're faster at reading and you want to see instant gratification on how someone picks up the material. But if you look at the bigger picture, those people might not be able to retain it as well. But the person with dyslexia who takes their time to meticulously break things apart, word it together, it retains the information so much more. Now, I know what some of you are probably saying, oh, I can't remember anything, because I know I can't. It affects everyone differently, but I think Whoopi's a great example on how something which, on a light touch, looks like a negative, actually can have a lot more benefits attached to it. Back to some fun questions. What do you know now about dyslexia that you wish you knew sooner? We've talked a lot about trauma today. You know, let's try and break the cycle. If you could talk to the younger you, what would you say to them now, which you think could help them grow through their kind of experience? This could get a little bit deep. So uh, take your time. This is not only about troubles of reading. Yes, tell them early on. I think I probably could have done with some like 
good role models when I was younger. I know people would often tell me it gets easier, it gets easier, but I think I would have liked some more tangible examples, ones that I could really kind of see. I mean, I'm not talking about Richard Branson here because he's a bit unrelatable, but just some more like real life people. You got that explains my creativity. Nice. Part of the kind of abilities that come with it. I'm stronger at big picture and creative thinking, which are valuable skills. Yes. The things you are good at are very much needed and sought after life. Your time in the sun might not be in school, but you wait after. That might be the time where you can really show the world you've got something to offer, which not many other people have. So yeah, really great answers, everyone. So what are some support available? You're an adult, you're dyslexic, you know, you've had a nice therapy session with me today. What is there available? Well, there's some Facebook groups, which we have like, exceptional individuals. One is like dyslexic opportunities. It's actually quite buzzing. You know, a lot of people are messaging it. It's a good place just to unwind and kind of like maybe rant, share suggestions. We've also got EI, exceptional individuals, coaching and mentoring. Coaching is when they kind of walk you through the different processes and mentoring is when someone who might be a dyslexic professional will kind of like take you under their wing and support you. There's also like different assistive technologies. And one thing you could do is record meetings or important conversations to listen to them again. One of the reasons we record today's sessions, you might use a dictaphone, you might use a pen and paper, whatever it takes. Also things like speech to text where you can speak into a mic and it translates. For me, that's a lifesaver. Now, obviously these are like just hardly any things at all, but the important thing to take away from this is there is support available. And don't expect everyone to be, you know, uh, knocked out in the park winner. A lot of them aren't gonna work for you. I think when it comes to finding support from neurodiverse people, it's like a cocktail, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a bit of shaking around. Oh, taste awful. Let's try again until you get the right combination. Nice. And we've got Sanjan says, I am not stupid. I have a brain difference. I am different, not a failure. And I think you've got to keep telling yourself that because if if the if the rest of the world's not telling you, well, you've got to be your own advocate. And I tell you, people will eventually kind of follow suit. So before we finish up for the day, any other support options that you know of? So are there things that have helped you in life? Maybe system for technology, maybe support groups, anything which you think if someone else saw this, potentially they could take that away and maybe benefit them. Okay, for myself, what has really helped me? Uh, I think just learning more about it, really. Knowledge really is power. The more I learned about it, the more I understand how my brain works, maybe more proud of it. We've got reading dyslexic strengths. Nice. nice. That's a good one. I'm always uh, interested in reading more books. Studying has been great for me. Coaching. Coaching is really useful. Colleagues, families, friends, just having a good support strategy. We've got dyslexic support groups on Facebook. Good to share experiences. Absolutely. Different memory techniques. It's going to be different for everyone, but I think there are going to be things that help. If you feel that your dyslexia is holding you back, do not think that is something which is kind of fixed in place. I think it's a combination of working on how you see it and also finding the places in society which already accept it. Don't get me wrong, they're difficult to find, but they do exist. We've got spider graphs. Nice. I, I like um, infographics, you know, where they break complex things up in lots of images. Bullet points, yes, bullet points are a lifesaver for me. Mm. I I know I talk about it all the time, but things that like read it out loud to me really, really help me with uh, concentration. So here are some quick things on when we got our information today. We're trying to make these webinars more scientific. So uh, feel free to check some of them out when on the recording. And if any of you are dyslexic, which a lot of you are, if not all of you, and are in the workplace, I bang about it a lot of the time, but do consider about contacting us for a workplace needs assessment. It's a free thing to do, and it does mean you can get that support, that's training. If any of you aren't diagnosed, it doesn't matter. You can still get support with us. And is it an official diagnosis? No, but I would argue it's like the next best thing. You get all the support you'd get if you were diagnosed, without the kind of strain and of like 
paying the money for one. But if you are diagnosed, still eligible as well. So get in contact if this does apply for you. I think it's a great opportunity and it's why I am such a big advocate or promoting it each webinar. So we have done it, but any last questions or forever hold your peace? Any questions on dyslexia or maybe just some final words of encouragement that you might want to share with everyone? Exceptional individual works in work in schools, like with school teachers. Do you know what? Good question. It's something which we have done. It's not something we officially do, but it is okay. something we're planning to do. So yes, we're currently in talks with schools to do that. But our main demographic is people who are of working age and above. But um, we're not opposed to anything. Okay. So would it be in schools with pupils or would it would be with the teachers? If uh, at the moment, some of the talks are with students, but we also work with anyone who I think is either in work or approaching the job market. So are we going to work with like young children? Probably not. But we do work with um, graduates, with students, you know, people along those lines. OK, cool. Oh, Indigo says there is a film on Netflix called I Used to Be Famous, which is about an autistic drummer. Very good and filmed in my manner. Beckham. Nice. I looked at that. I'm actually going to, I'm definitely going to watch that. It looks really interesting. And if you want to get in contact, here's our details. You know what to do. Just drop us a message, email, phone, whatever. We're here for you. But I hope you found that interesting today. Found a few little gems and I always enjoy uh, spending my Thursdays with you. I even delayed my uh, holiday just to stay here for you today. I genuinely enjoy it. <laughs>